guest today, Roger Mullen. Good morning or good afternoon, Roger. Hello. Good afternoon. Well, maybe <laughs> I should just uh, say a little introduction about you um, before yes. we go into talking about the main um, business of the day. And Roger, um, for those of you, I'm sure most of you know of Roger, he's got a very illustrious career. He's just told you for yep. you in the 1970s. Um, he's an academic, an honorary professor at the University of Stirling. He's lectured in a number of subjects. Um, he's the founding director of Momentous Change Limited with uh, Michelle Thompson, also a former vice convener of the SNP. Uh, Roger was the, the MP for Kirkcaldy and Cowdenbeath from 2015 to 2017. He's been the Treasury spokesman, was appointed a member of the Growth Commission and also is a member of the advisory team for the African Entrepreneurial Network. So he's got a very wide range of expertise and experience. So we're... Well, if, if I could just say sometimes that's an indication that he's not very good at any one thing. Oh. So he's got to try lots of things. We know that. We know heard from you before, so we know that is absolutely not true. <laughs> we know that's not true because we've, we've had the pleasure of your company on the show before. So, um, Roger, um, we asked you on today because we're particularly interested writing in your blogs. We've been following your blogs with great interest recently on a variety of issues, uh, things like reform of the internal structures of the SNP. But today, we'd really like to concentrate more about economics. And um, what you were going to be telling us was the, the, the sort of theme, um, was because yeah. I believe you're working on an article at the moment for the iScot magazine about the challenges that are facing Scotland in the in the wake of the... Um, of the pandemic, really, um, yeah. and, and things like technological change, climate change. So I don't know, where, it's a, such a huge topic. Where would you like to start? Um, just Well, let, let me just start by laying out how I see the world, right? And therefore, where I come to trying to make sense of the challenges, right? Uh, the way in which I see the world is it's filled with uncertainty. And it's filled with uncertainty and that provokes change. Sometimes we go through periods in history when change is rather modest and things appear to be relatively stable. And sometimes we get through periods where great events happen and they spur huge change. So kind of obvious examples of that historically would be, say, the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. In its wake sparked change uh, uh, that affected really every walk of life, mm -hmm. you know. So although some would see it as an economic change in the way in which we organised undertaking uh, work, for example, it spilled over into everything. Yeah. And what that shows you is that things that spark change often have impacts and consequences far beyond our expectation. And that in itself is another reason, I believe, for justifying my approach of saying I'm always uncertain about what's going to happen. And I don't like people who come along and say, I understand this perfectly and I've got the solution, I talk with certainty. Whenever people approach things saying, I know the answer, I can talk with certainty on this, I immediately become very cautious. Right? And so that's it. broadly what I'm interested in is in the issue of uncertainty and what's supposed to change. I mean, in more recent times, we know there have been things like world wars, like World War I, sparked a lot of social change much so. right, and demands after that great event. What I've been ruminating around at the moment, and it's always very difficult when you're in the midst of things to make sense of things. You know, it'll be, mm. it'll be much yeah. easier in 30 years time to look back and say what I'm about to say to you, whether it has any merit or not. But the way in which I'm feeling about things at the moment 
I see as in, a, as in a period of remarkable change and accelerating change, yeah. and if you like, uh, increasing uncertainty, not because of one big event, like the Industrial Revolution or like a world war, but because of the coming together of a range of things. And the ones that I'm particularly interested in at the moment are really four things. Mm -hmm. right? uh, one you've already mentioned, so I'll mention it again, and that is the impact of the pandemic yeah. and what that is creating. So maybe we can come to that. Mm -hmm. Another one that people will be very familiar with is uh, broadly in the field of the environment, particularly climate change and what the impact that is going to have in our world. Yeah. Right? The third one is, and I think you've mentioned, is technological change. And I would relate technological change to the uh, spurring of, or the possibility of spurring on further entrepreneurship and the like. And of course, what do I mean by entrepreneurship and innovation? That's just things are going to, things are changing because people have new ideas. And that spurs, whether it's the creation of new products, new ways of doing things, new ways of caring for people, whatever, and that kind of innovation spurs change. And a lot of this, a lot of the change that's happening now is highly technologically driven for a whole host of reasons. And the final thing, and the thing that I'm disappointed that there's not more, I mean, I know there's some discussion, but in my view, not enough discussion, is in the whole area of huge shifts in demography, huge demo demographic changes taking place, not just in Scotland, not just in the UK, but if you look across the world, you're getting huge demographic change in advanced societies, eh, such as eh, throughout Europe, eh, the um, Americas, and you're also getting, because of policy interventions, huge demographic change in the likes of China, for example, because of its one child policy and things mm -hmm. like that. So, in a lot of places, what is being found is that the shape of society's demography is changing. And we've got to understand that better and think about how we're going to intervene. So for example, you mentioned I was on the Sustainable Growth Commission. And although you would think by listening to some people, it was all just about currency. Uh, the area in which I tried to make a contribution was precisely because of my concern about demography. And so I, I was suggesting policy things, some of which got into the final report, about how we would change uh, a visa system for an independent Scotland to make it much more open mm -hmm. for societies, uh, uh, encouraging people to come here, lend their skills, invest in Scotland and the like. But some people have dismissed that, dismissed that. Some economists dismiss putting change, putting demography as a key aspect. And I think a lot of that is because, although if you go way back in time, let's say we go way back to the 18th century, to the time of Adam Smith, when you got the creation of what has become known or became known as classical economics, uh, uh, what was involved in that? You know, it might surprise some people to know that classical economics covered people with very, very different views on the world. It went from the likes of Adam Smith, Karl Marx and the like. But what was central to their way of trying to understand economics was precisely change. Right? They were driven by trying to explain change that took place and they tried to model that in their understanding. They also didn't make the mistake that I think many more modern uh, economists if you like make. And that is try to think that what you can do is model economics as if it's, as if it's like the physical sciences, as if yeah. there is an exactness to it, yeah. uh -huh. when there isn't an exactness yeah. to it. Yeah. Indeed, the more in which some branches of economics, say macroeconomics or, or uh, neoclassical economics, tries to model the physical world, the more it creates problems for their understanding because it doesn't relate 
to what is actually happening in wider society yeah. and wider so your life, right? My life, Marlene's life. We will have lived through in our short lifespans <laughs> colossal change. Mm -hmm. And I think most of us would recognize that not only have we lived through lots of change, but change is coming faster and faster and faster. Yeah, yeah. So if you don't have a way of understanding society that recognizes and puts change at its heart, it is not going to be able to give us the kind of understanding that we need. Yeah, yeah. So that's where I start. And I, I, I just think... Sorry, Roger. Um, it's just to put, so that folk listening know the thing, the point about the demographics from the point of view of Scotland is because we're, um, we're a bit top heavy, aren't we? Um, the proportion of those of us who are older is, is um, getting to be uh, greater than is easily dealt with, isn't it? Yeah, and, 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 and the important thing is the relative thing, so that yeah. the older population is growing, and of course, the late, those of working age population in proportion yeah. is shrinking and shrinking fast. So if we were to continue to run a society uh, as in the past, if you like making the assumption there's always going to be enough people around to do all the work, to create the new products, uh, uh, to create uh, uh, advances in our, in our standard of living and all the rest of it, a lot of those assumptions have to be addressed, right? Uh, because we, we, we cannot go forward with the same assumptions that we had in the 1950s or 60s about the shape of society. And that's true not just for Scotland. As I said, it's true in many, many parts of the world. Yeah. Right? And, and so we've got to grapple with these things and try and think about what are we going to do, right? I think it was uh, Kirsty Blackman uh, uh, with tongue in cheek about uh, a couple of years ago suggested that we needed to have an awful lot more sex in society to create an awful lot more babies <laughs> uh, to fill this gap, you know, and... Uh, uh, official SNP policy. <laughs> well, I, well uh, I, I, I hasten to add, not for people of my vintage. <laughs> <laughs> Count me out. As they say. <laughs> but but, but I'll, uh, although it was a fun way of putting it, it actually yeah. raised a very serious problem. Yeah. You know, if this demographic change continues in the way in which it's going, all that's going to happen is our working age population is proportionately going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what are we going to do? Now, this is where some of the things I raised earlier interrelate with this. But I'll give you just one example. One of the ways of uh, making sure we don't become unnecessarily impoverished because of this, right, is to say that we want to encourage greater productivity, as it's called in society. And that's where technology has always been an aid to improvements in productivity. So in one sense, we may be fortunate that at the same time as we've got this demographic challenge, we also have the prospect of a fast changing technologically, a technological society, which could be harnessed in ways in which would mean that a, a, we can, albeit in a different way, address the need to continue to be what, what in common sense terms would be a, an economically a, a stable and functioning society. So these things interrelate, but people have also got to equip themselves so that at the individual level, so that at the community level, so that at the business level, so that at the academic level, mm -hmm. we become much more aware of change as a facet of society. And we're going to have to think deeply about how we're going to accommodate that as we try and create policies for the future. In, in terms of um, like 
practical policy making in, in terms of Scotland. Can you give us an example of the kind of, uh, of policies that you see could be um, affected by, you know, the theory of, of change in this way? Is, is that, am I expressing that um, properly? I don't know if you know what uh, I'm... I don't know, but being a politician, regardless of how you express it, <laughs> Yeah, I've got things I want to say. <laughs> anyway, you know, <laughs> I mean, what I would say is, first of all, if you had asked me, can I think in areas that are not going to be affected by change, I can't think in any. Yeah. Right? So that in one sense, and, and I mean, this means there will be areas of which I have absolutely no expertise at all are going to be affected by the rate of change in our society and the things that are spurring that change. So there are some things I might think I know about, and there are some things that I don't know about, but what I'm convinced is that it, we live in a world of uncertainty and change, and that's not going to be, do anything other than accelerate in the future, right? So, uh, so there's that. In, in terms of examples of what you do, I would just go back to the wee example uh, uh, that I gave you uh, a short time ago in the Growth Commission. My view is we need to become a really attractive place to encourage people to come here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? uh, and particularly, you know, we should be a welcoming society for younger people, just as other societies have been welcoming to uh, those of our generation who chose not to stay in Scotland but to go overseas. I mean, I, uh, uh, my older brother emigrated to Canada in the 1960s and my older sister emigrated uh, a few years after him uh, to Canada. So I lived when I was growing up at a time when there was huge emigration from Scotland and people have gone to be pioneers in other countries. And so what we need today is we need to be ourselves in Scotland. We need to be more pioneering and imaginative about our approach to things. So we need pioneers in our own country and we need to be open to a, a encouraging people who would want to come here. That's quite difficult, of course, because we are hampered by... Um, at the moment, because we're not independent yet, we we don't we're hampered by quite a xenophobic uh, government in, in Westminster, where, where you know they're moving to restrict immigration. But do you think there is some hope that e even before we're independent, there might be some possibility of Scotland having um, devolved power over immigration policies? What do you think that's? Possible? I think I think it's going to be difficult to imagine that the UK government are going to want to devolve any new powers mm -hmm. to any of the devolved administrations. I mean, all the evidence we have from this government is that precisely the reverse. Yeah, like the internal the, market bill. Like the internal example. market bill, it, it wanting to restrict the mm -hmm. possibility. Yeah. What yeah. we need to do is there are some fears where we need to encourage imagination and thinking. So that, for example, I do think we could do more to support young entrepreneurs in Scotland, to encourage them, right? I do think we could do better about linking up our universities. We've got, we've got a colossal asset in our universities, and I know many of them make huge contributions already, but that does not mean that they could not do more, that we could not tie in our universities to help in this drive to become more entrepreneurial. You know, there's a friend of mine, well, uh, two friends of mine, yes, I have two friends, who, have, uh, uh, who are very interested in hydrogen yeah. energy and technology yeah. and who are of the view, uh, I'm not an expert in this field, but they are certainly of the view that we could be doing far more to encouraging that we could be doing far more already to give out the right messages yeah. that Scotland is a welcoming place for people who want to contribute in 
it, new technologies such as that. Yeah, so, and that's a that's a very that's a very kind of pertinent one for Scotland because I mean it takes a lot of my my background's chemistry, Roger. Right. Although I've forgotten it all basically, but I do remember that it you know it takes quite a lot of energy to produce hydrogen from you can do it by splitting water. But we've got yeah. lots of energy, you know, you can produ we can produce hydrogen, use it to power boats, power lorries, power cars if we wanted to. And we can do it using our surplus of renewable electricity because it just needs electricity to do it. It's fantastic. Yeah. And one of the other things that we need to become an awful lot better at is making sure we look at, if you like, the whole supply chain. Yeah. Yeah. And the downstream activities and the like. Yeah. So. We've been very good in the past, for example, at having people uh, uh, in our universities, let's say, chemists in our universities, <laughs> who do not just educating people, such as yourself when you were a university student, but they also do research. Yes. And so the research space of our universities is extensive. And they have been, they have been the place where new ideas have come out and flourished. But very often Scotland has been extremely poor at harnessing all the benefits of those ideas. So they've tended to go offshore. Yeah. We, we have got many industries that uh, eh, eh, where we could have been doing more eh, eh, over the last 50 years or more to encourage developments if we had taken a much wider view of how are we going to promote, how are we going to make best use of the ideas that we are generating. So I would like to see much more than on that on that front. And, and that those, would, that those ideas be... can produce, they can produce money, can't they can produce, well, they can produce jobs, they can produce um, taxation revenue, but only if they stay in Scotland. I mean, obviously you want, as a global citizen, you want to see yeah. the world benefit. Yeah. But you don't want it to be elsewhere in the world benefits from our ideas and we don't. We don't, yeah. <laughs> you know, that would be a foolish approach for any society to take. And in all honesty, and I know I mean, this is not the fault of a uh, uh, devolved government, which we've had for a comparatively short period of time. But one of the great tragedies is that Scotland has not only had great physical assets, and still has great physical assets, but has had huge assets and ideas. Absolutely. Has had huge assets of people, right? Now, my brother had to emigrate to Canada because he couldn't get a job offer mm. in Scotland. But by the time he was in his early 30s, he was a secretary of the Science Council of Canada. He went on to become the Canadian representative internationally. He chaired the OECD Science and Technology Committee. He was brought in after the Democratic Revolution in South Africa to meet Mel Mel Nelson Mandela and helped write their first science and technology policy. Wow. Right? Now, somebody like that mm. who couldn't get an opportunity in Scotland, that is ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. A loss. A loss of... A complete loss. Yeah. And he... He didn't set out when he was the first in our family to go to university. He didn't set out with the idea of, I want to get well-educated and I then want to beat it out of Scotland. No. He sought opportunities in Scotland and found that they weren't there. The first job offer he got was from Canada. Mm. So he took it. And, that, and his story is by no means unique. Right. Now, there will always be a flow of people. I mean, I'm not against in, in, in people leaving Scotland and going elsewhere in the world. I mean, I've spent a lot of my life, although I've always been based in Scotland, I've worked internationally a lot. A, 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 and I think that has been a, a, a good thing and a purposeful thing, a, a, not just for me, but for many people. But we have to make sure, we have to make sure that we make the most of our opportunities in Scotland. Mm. And I don't think we've been very good at that. Yeah, yeah. One thing you mentioned about change, and, and that's something that, um, you know, like we touched on, you mentioned the pandemic. Yeah. I wondered, I mean, there's that is something that is very, and you mentioned entrepreneurial spirit as well. 
at the moment that's a huge thing that we're seeing um, many businesses very successfully um, adapting uh, with great creativity in, in hugely difficult circumstances and I think the term they're using is pivot where they're, they're, they're you know maybe say they're a restaurant and then they're going to home deliveries or that they never did before where it was a sit-in only restaurant or they're doing takeout I mean that's a very sort of crude example but there seems to be a lot of businesses that are using this entrepreneurial spirit and ingenuity to adapt to these very difficult circumstances I wonder if you've got any ideas on that uh, uh, well I mean I think your, your example is actually a very good one right I mean what it shows is here are people who are used to one model of business that model of business would have long since collapsed mm. unless they changed, right? So that in terms of uh, uh, entrepreneurs, you know, away in the past, when I used to, when I uh, at university in this very uh, field, we used to, I used to say there are, there are two types of entrepreneurs. There are necessity entrepreneurs, where people had, were forced to change. Yeah. Or they didn't survive and then there are what I've predominantly been talking about is opportunity entrepreneurs entrepreneurs who come up with new ideas mm -hmm. and want the opportunity to implement them and make the most of them and so what I think we're probably getting at the moment is we're getting quite a lot of necessity entrepreneurship yeah. happening in our society because people are being forced by the pandemic to change right and some of them might want to go back to the way in which they operated in the past. But very often when you get these types of large changes in society, things don't go back to exactly as they were before. Mm -hmm. For example, I found a terrific wee Italian restaurant in Kirkcaldy that supplies me with a takeout meal at least twice a week, <laughs> right? Now, this is, a, this is a number of great advantages. One is to Barbara, my wife, who <laughs> says, I don't make a complete and utter bomb sight of the kitchen <laughs> by insisting that I try and make the evening meals. So, so, <laughs> so uh, uh, and I mean, I won't go back to, we won't go back to the, the, the same as we were yeah. in the past yeah. in, in that sense. So, that, so that, that, that's actually a, a good example, things that people will be familiar with. But there are all sorts of a, a other things that are taking place. And of course, the pandemic in economic terms has been a very, very different type of crisis, right? Uh, mostly in our lifetime, when there have been dips in the recession, it's been because of, for a whole host of reasons, a lack of demand in society, right? This has been not a demand side crisis, but a supply side yeah. crisis yeah. created by government. Yeah. Because government have decided to close down business. Mm -hmm. Not because people didn't want to go out and have a pint in their pub of an evening, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a lack of demand that has presented a lot of our pubs with real problems of survival. It has been a supply side policy issue of government. Yeah. Right? And that is going to have changed a, a, our, the structure of our business, business communities when we come out of this, as hopefully, even if we come out very quickly, Right, we, in my judgment, we won't be able to completely rewind to how we are, how things were in the past. A lot of, in some sectors, things will have changed, perhaps just a very little. In other sectors, they will have changed a great deal. But the one thing that we do know, I think, we can tell history tells us that with these big shocks, it does create change. Mm -hmm. It might be an open question as to the extent of the change at the moment. We don't know that at the moment, but nonetheless, it's creating change. My argument is we're now getting change driven by not one big event, 
were getting changed, driven by demography, driven by technological change, driven by the pandemic. And of course, as we all so no, it added to that uh, the climate change, yes, challenge, also, yeah. which is again and, and those things are in, change in the world. Those, those things are interconnected as well. It's not just like there's four Absolutely. separate things; they are interconnected. Especially, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, I was going to say just especially maybe climate change and the extent to which we are destroying the planet's environment for other species apart from ourselves and linking that up to the, the likelihood of more pandemics arising. So there, yeah. there, there's a, it's a very complex network, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. And anybody who comes along with a model, whether it's in economics or politics or anything, and says, here, I've got a nice simple model, right? Mm. Uh, but by the way, my model doesn't take account of change. And you've also made an extremely important point, Marilyn, doesn't take account of complexity. Mm -hmm. You know, there has been an unfashionable strand in academic circles for uh, a number of years of people who are called complexity theorists. They're now coming into their own. Yes. People who are interested in the idea of complexity. And of course, complexity goes hands in hands with uncertainty. Right? And so that you can see this uh, uh, changing to a lot of the narrative even about politics. Listen to the briefings that are given nowadays on the pandemic by Nicola Sturgeon regularly. She often, and in my view, absolutely correctly says, I don't know. Right. I'm, I'm uncertain. Yeah, right. Yeah. And to yeah. me, one of the great strengths she has is by understanding and admitting we are living in uncertain times and therefore our policy actions won't always get the positive outcome that we're looking for because of that uncertainty. Now, to me, that is highly rational and right. I would much rather have that than somebody strutting up to the lectern <laughs> and thinking, just leave it to me. Yeah. I've got this fixed, folks. Yeah. I know what's going yeah. on. Yeah. You know, Trump like pretending that they've got the solutions. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I don't know anybody. I don't know of any economic or social theory that I would say has anything remotely like all the solution solutions or anything remotely like fully understanding the nature of uncertainty and how it's going to affect us in the future. And so I think a lot of people, academics included, eh, need to have a bit more humility. And I, for one, have welcomed that aspect of humility that's been coming across in the First Minister's mm -hmm. I, I think that's such an important point, you know, that, I, that struck me the other day, you know, when there were the, the, the constantly these journalists harping about people need clarity and people are fed up and all this, but I'm, I, 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 it seems to me that, you know, we are adults, you can't get fed up with reality, you have to face it head on and demanding that people, mm. um, you know, need clarity about Christmas no they don't you know like anybody who's got any sense knows that you can't have clarity in the face of um, uncertainty about the virus but also the economic uncertainty where the levers of power over furlough for example are being operated by a government over which we have very little control. I know and there is an incredible naivety about decisions that are made you know it, when you listen to many of the journalists they want to criticize on the basis of you made this decision in the 14th of august yeah and here it's all going haywire here as if you only make decisions at one point in time and then you've just got to live with the consequences it's like that it, it reminds me of a, a story I, I used to teach a thing called applied decision theory at university right and I used to tell students of a story of a, a, an airline leaving Tokyo, right? 
Uh, I think this is not a true story. It's just for <laughs> demonstration purposes. So a pilot leaves, jumps in his jumbo jet, and flies all the way across to America, right? Tries to land at Los Angeles Airport, overshoots the runway by 100 meters, right? Uh, uh, practically goes into the drink. Anyway, there is inevitably an inquiry. So here's the inquiry, and it says to the, the, and so the inquiry asked the pilot, how come you missed the runway in Los Angeles by 100 meters? Is that incompetence? To which the pilot replies, considering where I started from, I didn't miss by very much. <laughs> Right? Now, the reason that is so stupid is the reason many journalist questions at the moment are yeah. so stupid. They think we can, we can measure the decision back when you left Tokyo Airport by what happened when you landed in Los Angeles. So that, of course, anybody who's rational, what you should be saying is... Uh, what were all the little iterative decisions along the journey yeah. that led yeah. us to this point? So that if I thought we had a first minister that said, well, that's it, I've made this decision today, so we're not going to do anything for six months. I've made that decision, that's it all over. That's an utterly naive world, particularly in a world filled with uncertainty. What you want is somebody who's saying, with the evidence I have at my disposal today, the rational decision yeah. is such and such, but there's always a chance this is going to go wrong. Yeah, yeah. and exactly. Nicola has been saying that, hasn't she? I, I know she has. And yeah. so what, what this is, is, what this is, is an iterative process, right? As new information and new understanding comes in, you, you adjust, you change, right? That's what I would want to see throughout much of the world. And, that, and that's what in many people's conception of the world or the economy or whatever is lacking. They lack this appreciation of the nature of decision-making in context of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think we need much greater, it would be really good for politics if the kind of narrative yeah. that has been created around the decision-making this pandemic would be something that would infiltrate all areas of yeah. political decision making. Yeah, yeah. That, that's uh, uh, that, that's uh, interesting. Um, that's interesting you saying that, uh, Roger, because because um, I mean obviously the first minister's you know approach to doing these uh, updates. I mean apart from anything else, just being there day after day after day is dead impressive, and the uh, the, the approach that she's taking, I'm sure, is one big reason why you know. Her, I was going to say popularity, but it's not really popularity. It's people trust what she says, and you see it. You see it in the way they they do polling for that just now. So they trust her. Have got trust in Scottish government, in, at least in terms of dealing with the pandemic, compared to a lack of trust in Westminster. And and you and you see that this issue of trust is culturally very important. We know that it affects the the world far beyond politics. Yeah. I mean, for example. I've been very interested in trying to get uh, uh, reforms of the financial sector. Uh, uh, this is going to be a big job. But think about the loss of trust in banks that has happened because of their behaviour, particularly after 2008. And the decision making was exposed and the way in which yeah. they treated small businesses has been exposed. So. This issue of trust is very important for society, and it, and it goes well beyond just the realm of politics. Yeah, indeed. And, I mean, you, you sort of see, I mean, especially, uh, I don't know if you watched Mr. Trump's meltdown in the White House last yeah, night. You know, I, I mean, he's destroying people's trust in, in, in his own country, you know, in his own political processes, democratic processes. I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. It, Marlene, people have got to be very careful because words can have very practical consequences. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's my big worry. Yeah. That's also why I worry about a lot of the political debate that happens in Scotland. Yeah. 
yeah. around some areas. I don't particularly want to go into it, but yeah, yeah. you know as well as I do, there are areas where it's just people shouting at one another and calling one another names and all the rest of it. Yeah. I mean, that is, that is not good for anybody. It is not good for society. It sheds yeah. light yeah. on yeah. absolutely nothing. Yeah. So that I think, so some people criticise me because in one of my blogs I wrote about effectively the need for us to be a lot more careful about our discourse, a lot more careful about the language we use. And, you know, uh, I got a long email from somebody who was saying that, no, 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 we need to be, you know, get piled in and to be even more aggressive because these are all bad people uh, uh, and the like. And I just don't accept that. I mean, my view is that what we want to do in the political world is is persuade people. Yes, yes. And I don't yes. think I I will ex persuade anybody by swearing at them or calling them names. I think it's much better to have a, a discourse or yes, a, yes. a more civilised discussion with them. Civil and and that in part yes. reflects, because I'm, I'm uncertain, about uh, our think we live in a world of uncertainty. I also wrote a blog about uh, 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 I think we need to be very careful about not imposing our moral values on other people, right? Uh, I, I'm not certain about a whole host of things, you know? Mm. I mean, if you, if you take the likes of religious beliefs, I don't know what I would call myself. It varies minute to minute. That's <laughs> 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 what I am. I'm just hugely uncertain about everything. So you know, look, in, people, in the midst of all this, um, in the midst faith. of the uncertainty, and um, you know, we started off talking. You were, you were, you know, introducing your your ideas and thoughts about the challenges facing um, facing us, you know, particularly in Scotland. Uh, so just, just to, I'm just aware of the time passing here, uh, Roger. I mean, if you, what would you most want? Is there something you would most want the Scottish government to set in motion, you know, economically now oh, to help yeah. us going forward? Absolutely. And this is born of my experience internationally. If I had any influence in the Scottish government, I would say, in fact, before now, but certainly now, they need to set up a transition group to look at all the transition things that need to be undertaken. Oh. There's lots of work going on, for example, uh, some of it internally in the Scottish government, some of it in the SNP, some of it in the wider Yes movement, some of it in think tanks like Commonweal and the like, uh, focusing on policy. And I welcome the richness of the policy debate yeah. that takes place. But very few people have been looking at what are the practicalities of moving towards independence. So things like, for example, what's our view going to be of manning senior levels of the civil service? We don't have a Scottish civil service at the moment. How are we going to construct that? Because we'll need, we'll need one. How are we going to uh, populate it, particularly at the top levels? And I think that, uh, uh, that needs to be, uh, uh, to be looked at. So there's all sorts of things we need to transition. Uh, uh, that really came home to me when I was in the early 1990s in Namibia. I think I wrote about this in another of my blogs. And I was called one day to go along to the Prime Minister's office to meet one of his senior advisors called Lomai Rangula. And I walked into the Prime Minister's office and I met him and he walked up to me and he said to me, how are Glasgow Rangers doing? <laughs> now, now, the importance of that is uh, not that he supported the wrong football team. <laughs> 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 it should have been Air United, of course. The, <laughs> the the, Race Rovers. <laughs> or, uh, or Mint, Rovers Ma, or Montrose, Montrose, you forgot about Montrose. Montrose. <laughs> but the importance of that was Years before Namibia had achieved its independence, it had identified people who were going to fulfill roles in their government oh, right. well in advance. So that, for example, Lohmeyer was identified and told that 
his, I think it was his third degree that he was being funded for, they said, we don't want you coming as a young man to Namibia and fight this civil war that's going on. We want you to prepare for when we win independence. And so he was told about four years in advance of them achieve, yeah. finally getting their independence, yeah. that he was going to have a role looking at HR policy yeah, in government. Yeah. And he had to do his next degree in HR policy, which I think was at Strathclyde University. And another guy that I met, Samuel Lagoseb. Uh, Sam, I eventually became very good, such good friends with him. I became the best man at his wedding. Uh, uh, and Sam had been identified, he was leader of the students in Cuba, and he was identified well in advance of the role that he was going to have, so that he knew once independence was achieved and he was brought over to Namibia, he was going into a role as being a personal assistant to the fisheries minister Fantastic, yeah. And that's where I first met him in yeah, connection yeah. with that. That's, that's such an intelligent way to set yeah, things but, up, isn't it? Yeah, and Sam is now the ambassador for Namibia mm. in Cuba. So he had a Fantastic. meteoric <laughs> rise. Yeah. Now, the, the point I make there is that we've not been doing any of that planning and preparation. Mm. And we need to do it quickly. The other thing I would say is I think this would be, this would help the movement at the moment who are worried that uh, uh, perhaps there's not a strong enough drive towards independence. If we were setting up a commission, right, to say, right, what we want to have is a transition commission or working group, I don't care what you call it. And as from now, we are going to look at the way in which we are going to put in place all the practical things we need to do. Let me give you one other example. If we become independent, we're going to have all these uh, uh, bodies like Scottish Enterprise, the Scottish Funding Council and the, and the like. They no doubt will move into uh, uh, be part of our architecture. We're going to need to redefine what their roles are. Yeah. Very much yeah. so. Why are we not starting redefining the roles now in yeah. advance rather than waiting and do it in the last minute? Yeah. Not only we will have to redefine all public roles, we are going to have to create some new ones yeah. because there's lots of areas that are not devolved and we don't have any realistic infrastructure to immediately wow. press the button and say yeah. go. Uh, thank you very much and thanks for coming on our programme today yep. and I hope yeah. you have a lovely weekend. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Valerie, and thanks, yeah. Marlene. Thank you. Thanks again. Oh.